Welcome to the FeeCast, your weekly dose of economic thinking from your friends at the Foundation for Economic Education. As ever, I'm Richard Lawrence here with Brittany Hunter, Dan Sanchez, and Marianne March. And the very first question I have for you today is, is anyone thirsty? Always. Well, I mean, we always have our our mugs with water, soft drink, or tea, or whatever. But if we were thirsty and we didn't have something to drink, it's possible we would just be able to go out to the street and find either a shop or maybe even someone who is there selling water or other types of beverages. And there's actually a story along these lines out of California this week where a young girl was caught by, I guess, an older person who decided that she didn't like what this person was doing. And this little girl was selling water on what I believe to be her property, or at least her parents' property. And this woman came out and started chiding her about the fact that she wasn't permitted to do this. And the internet has taken to calling this woman Permit Patty. (laughs) And we have an article on fee.org, and the link is actually just below, by Zach Slayback on Permit Patty and the odd situation that we find ourselves in in 21st century America where children, kids, are being chastised and stopped from being young entrepreneurs. Well, and it'd be one thing if she was chastising her directly and chiding her directly, because at least then that would be like the respect of considering another person uh, a fellow human being who is worth addressing directly, but she was calling the cops. Yeah, she's there sort of Mm -hmm. hiding from the camera behind a brick uh, pillar or something on the phone with the police. She tried, and then the the mom, or I think it was the mom of the child, came back and said, he can't hide from me. (laughs) She kept recording, so that was actually pretty cool. Yeah, I I think the, the... they are. They live close to AT and T Park in San Francisco. It was a hot day. This eight year old girl decides to make a little money selling bottled water. Perfect opportunity. Yes. Well, and I believe she actually was saving for Disneyland. She wanted to go to Disneyland. Her That's mom right. had just lost her job, and so instead of even doing like a GoFundMe or something, she actually made the decision to go mm-hmm. out, you know, meet consumer needs and sell water. And all of a sudden, it's turning into this this big thing. But there was no mm-hmm. shame on the part of Permit Patty when when the mm-hmm. mom was accusing her. Uh, she said, yeah, well, she's selling water without a permit, as, mm-hmm. as if that was obviously not just an, a legal thing to do, but like a morally outrageous yeah. thing to do. And the fun thing, maybe not so fun, about Permit Patty, of course, that's not her real name. The mm-hmm. Internet's just come to name her that, is that she is an entrepreneur herself. Yes. An entrepreneur of, a, of CBD oil, which requires a lot of permits and licensing. So this is something she's had to deal with firsthand. Mm-hmm. And instead of being empathetic towards someone else, she's calling the cops on an eight-year-old girl. But it's an interesting phenomenon because a lot of times you see entrepreneurs who do have to uh, jump through regulatory hurdles, mm-hmm. that they like those hurdles. Mm-hmm. Because if other entrepreneurs have to, to jump through them, and especially smaller entrepreneurs, then it gives them a competitive advantage. And so she might have that attitude towards others in her industry, and it maybe it just transferred mm-hmm. over to just people in general. It's and interesting. Oh, go on. I was just about to say, this whole sort of notion that she came from a permitted place and that she <laughs> wants this other person to be permitted come, may come from a place of envy. She had to do yeah. it, therefore other people right. have to do it as well. Doesn't why matter if it's it an eight-year-old hard, kid. Right. right. Why can't it be as hard for you as it is for me? Mm-hmm. Instead of why couldn't it just not be hard for everyone? <laughs> right. Well, <sighs> and so the other part of Zach's piece, which I encourage everyone to read, is that he talks about commercial culture and how we can begin to instill commercial culture back into the culture, right? So mm-hmm. instead of being uh, calling the police first when we see something that you know maybe we find objectionable but maybe doesn't quite require the police to come in, we could actually go up and talk to them like human beings. That's mm-hmm. one idea. Mm-hmm. Right. But then also we can begin to actually uh, encourage interaction in the commercial sense, in the marketplace. We can begin to encourage people to become entrepreneurs, not mm-hmm. to try to shut down kids when they try to do these new things. Well, and just thinking of profits as something worthy, uh, as something to be respected and admired. So we have another article Mm -hmm. about um, bourgeois dignity uh, Mm -hmm. on the website talking about Deirdre McCloskey's book by that name, uh, where she really describes the, the rise of the West as not just being a function of capital accumulation or the rise of pro- private property, but a moral change that people started looking at commerce as a noble venture. Mm. And, um, and as Zach points out, we don't have that now because we, we have people looking at it as suspect. Right. And, and only under permission is it 
even allowable, let alone adm- admirable. Mm-hmm. Deirdre McCloskey's work is brilliant, and it talks all about, like you said, the West. It wasn't Protestantism. It wasn't any of these other factors, but it was trade. It was commercial uh, interactions that ended up bringing them to a sense of prosperity materially. And dignity, and which dignity I think is a big well. point, too. Exactly. Yeah. And it, it, you mentioned profits as well. One of my very favorite quotations from The Economist, F.A. Hayek, is, profit is a signal mm-hmm. that we're serving well people who mm-hmm. we don't know. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and that is, it goes against against everything that I think people traditionally, at least today, are hearing about profits, that they're windfall profits, that they come at the expense of other people. But profit is actually something that shows us that we're creating value right. for other mm-hmm. people. If yeah. the little girl wasn't selling something people wanted, she would have a whole thing of water bottles left, and that wasn't the case. She was selling them. Exactly. So exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so this isn't the only piece that we have on our website about kids being impeded from exercising entrepreneurial instincts. It happened last summer. Right. Same well, thing. There's many, many stories about this. There was in 2015 a story out of Texas with kids um, being getting in trouble and for not getting the $150 permit fee, not even including what it would cost for the health department's approval. And then in 2011 in Maryland, kids received a $500 fine for selling lemonade without a permit. It's outrageous. Well, last summer, these boys were actually put in handcuffs in front of people on the National Mall. So you want to talk about dignity. Um, You have kids trying to actually go out there and earn a living for Mm -hmm. themselves or earn, you know, summer money. And they're sitting there in handcuffs while people are walking by. And they were also selling water bottles? They were selling water bottles without a permit. And so you have a couple pieces on our website. We'll probably put some links right (laughs) underneath the video that kind of talks about that. It's funny because when we're looking at uh, sort of these experiences of, of kids in 2017 and 2018, it reminds me of when I was a kid and we were selling not lemonade on the street in front of my house, but those little wax beads that you could actually organize on a little template and then iron yes, on, yes. on top of a piece of wax paper. We <laughs> artisan made crafts. Artisan crafts, exactly. The type of things that you could sell on Etsy today, probably. <laughs> and we would sell these things on in front of the house. And we actually mm-hmm. had a cop come by once, just kind of rolling by. This was sometime in the early 90s and just kind of looking With at sunglasses. us. sunglasses. Sunglasses <laughs> kind of looking at us a little bit suspect and then went on. But I can't imagine how that would turn out today. It probably even scared you without him even stopping, you know, a little bit jarring. Oh, yeah. of, am yeah. I doing something wrong just by selling something? Exactly. I think we all know that kid from our school who was the the hallway entrepreneur. In my school, there was a girl who sold blow pops for 25 cents each. And then she also rented DVDs. And her pitch was that she had more DVDs than Blockbuster and awesome. no late fees. Awesome. <laughs> no late fees. <laughs> Well, yeah. and so you also ended up having some other enterprises when you were younger, too. You were fixing... Oh, I fixed jewelry. Yeah. I had a pair of my dad's pliers, and that's basically all it took for me to be able to make little like loops and fix, of... fix earrings yeah. and necklaces. Yeah. And we have a great article on the site by Derek McGill called My Childhood as a Renegade Entrepreneur. It's a great that's piece. Right. And he was a serial <laughs> entrepreneur where he was just always <laughs> co- coming up with schemes of, of, thing, yeah. of ways to resell. Like he talks about reselling uh, Live Strong bracelets, uh, uh, going to Wendy's and, and buying like a whole bunch of $1 burgers and selling them for $5. Genius. Five dollars at, at a club fun- <laughs> fundraiser. And, and again, this is... This should be commended, but but in mm-hmm. in each of the cases, he talks about how uh, the school teachers and officials just cracked down on him and, and told him to stop each time. Yeah, well, they make it seem like it's something dirty that there's something wrong with children showing entrepreneurial spirit, finding finding a loophole, finding a way to with making money. Right. Really, it's like making money is dirty somehow. Yeah. I actually think you you have an interesting story about a school experience around yeah, that, Yeah, it was during the entrepreneurial unit. Um, so each of us in sixth grade had to learn about Ben & Jerry's and how they rose to you know prominence. And we each had to start our own business, make a model, buy something from somewhere else, and resell it. That was the whole purpose. So my group made shakes. We did candy bars and ice cream. You got to pick your candy Brilliant. bar, blended it. Well, after this whole unit had ended, we had all made, I think we made almost $200, which as a 12-year-old is a lot of money. And we were very excited. We were told we got to keep this money. Well, then the day came where they were supposed to pay it back, and the principal told us that we were not allowed to have that much money, that it was absurd to give this much money to kids, that we didn't have a right to that, and the school kept the money. Wait a second. It's absurd not only to give that much money to kids, but for kids to make money. To make money. money. During the entrepreneurship unit, we were told that (laughs) making money was not our right as children. Talk about cognitive dissonance there. That's nuts. And that we lost money. Our parents lost money because they paid for the supplies. So it was... What are they teaching us? And I, I think part of the concern is also they, they think that, oh, well, the, if you're selling to other kids, that those kids might get exploited. Because mm. I, I remember one time mm-hmm. I traded with another boy, like in elementary school. I had like a really uh, 
um, com complicated Transformers toy, and he had like this really simple, just like that lizard creature in Star Wars, and it was just like a cheap piece of plastic, basically, like much wor worth much less. And but I thought it was cool, so I, I traded it. It's a piece of plastic that you wanted, right? Right. <laughs> and then an adult overrided that trade, uh, forced us to to, to undo it, and. I, the, the idea was to protect me from my admittedly bad decision, but actually that kind of coddling um, makes uh, prevents kids from learning from right. those types of experience where, where you regret an exchange and then you adjust and, and you are uh, yes. more savvy for future exchanges. Buyer's remorse. Yes. Caveat and emptor. Mm -hmm. You've got to learn from it. We've... I at least have made purchases and then regretted it. Several. I shouldn't have ordered that. I shouldn't have bought that <laughs> online late at night. Bad decisions. You learn from them. <laughs> well, we're going to take a good decision now, and we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right at, back right after these messages. Hi, I'm Sean Malone, Director of Media for the Foundation for Economic Education. And I want to talk to you today about Fee's podcasts. You're currently listening to our wonderful FeeCast, but did you know we also have two other amazing podcasts for you to listen to each and every week? There's Words and Numbers featuring Anthony Davies and James Harrigan, where they talk about economics, political theory, and current events every Wednesday. We also have a brand new offering called the Fee Audio Experience, where we bring you content from our seminars and events held all across the country. You'll get to hear fascinating talks from speakers and panelists, which we'll make available to you right after each event. So be sure to check out the Fee Cast, Words and Numbers, and the Fee Audio Experience right here on our homepage at fee.org shows, and also subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. Thanks for listening. Welcome back. We've been talking about entrepreneurship versus a culture of permission that it seems to be is creeping further and further into our mainstream culture. And it actually bears saying that this article on Permit Patty that we were talking about in the last segment has been one of the most popular that we've had on the website in the last week. And so therefore, we've ordered a sequel. And that is coming out by Zach Slayback probably today, actually. Today, yes. And that one is talking a little bit more about this sort of culture that maybe we're picking up from some uh, unlikely places. Well, he traces it to school. Uh, he traces this culture of a permission-based mindset uh, to school where I mean, when you even have to raise your hand just to go to the bathroom. Yes. And, and he talks about, because he does professional consulting, and, and he talks about a lot of employers, like they're aghast when like they, they hire someone just fresh out of school, and they're actually asking for permission to go to, go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And so, so just this, this attitude that there's the, everything, uh, anything that isn't expressly permitted is mm -hmm. forbidden, right. ba basically. And sort of the, the tattletale culture right, too because right. when everything is authority based permission and, and, and permission based then it really cultivates this uh, attitude of, of kids tattling on kids they're actually encouraged a lot of the times to to tattle on kids when they're when they're breaking the rules and it, it, in, in some ways our whole political culture is like a massive tattletale if you see something say something exactly say, yeah. exactly right and so this piece by Zach we have a link for it actually just underneath the video it's entitled schools have created a generation of permanent patties and barbecue betties and actually barbecue betty was becky, was becky, becky yes. <laughs> was was someone who zach had previously mentioned in the other article as well mm -hmm. and this was because of another case that happened elsewhere right. there was a barbecue area in a park where a group of people were barbecue barbecuing using a charcoal grill and becky comes along and has a big problem with the charcoal calls the cops and but again, doesn't ask them first. There, there was no right. attempt mm -hmm. to say, hey, I don't know that you're supposed to be doing this. Right. Well, but also, mind your business, Becky. Th that's another point that Zach makes in the article is that in, um, in what schools are doing when, when they have this tattletale and permission c culture is that they are depriving kids of dispute resolution yeah. skills. Hmm. And hmm. So, so instead of working it out with, with other kids, you j it's just an instant recourse to authority. Yeah. And, and yeah, and, and it's dangerous. It's yeah. absolutely dangerous. If you can't talk with your peers at the very least, or talk with other people in a commercial setting or in a social yeah. setting generally, are we always going to wait until the police show up at our door and we have a problem with our next door neighbor? Mm -hmm. 
The thing that gets me is, do we not have enough to do that these people need to run around looking for permits like it's their job? (laughs) Get something better to do with your time. All right. So we're talking about permits. Permits are something I think most of us are familiar with if we've ever had a driver's permit or a license or whatever. But permits are pretty widespread, right? Licenses are very widespread. And ostensibly, they're in place to protect the safety of the consumer, right? The safety and scare quotes, right? Right. Well, okay. So let's talk about that. So one of the reasons that people might be against permits and mm-hmm. against licenses generally is in economics, we call the, these tools barriers to entry. And by that, we mean barriers to going into a job or a career. Mm-hmm. I don't know, Marianne, you've got actually a more complete definition of barriers right. to entry. So we tend to think about barriers to entry as being um, the costs or the obstacles for a newcomer to enter a market, enter an industry. And they can be more natural, such as it's expensive to do research and development, and it's hard to compete with Walmart when you're a little guy. But there's other barriers to entry as well. What's interesting about that, too, is uh, that's also known as ease of ease of doing business, I think, right? That's the opposite side, yeah. And mm-hmm. we're we're not number one. No, <laughs> we're not the no. easiest country to do business in, and we're going down the more permits we, you know, we put in. According to the World Bank, in 2017, it took, in the U.S., six calendar days to complete all the procedures to legally do business. You contrast that with a place like New Zealand, where it takes one day. And then on the very other end of the spectrum, in Venezuela, 230 days. 230 days to just get... A license? To, to, right, to complete all of the legal obstacles to legally running a business. Wow. Incredible. So, I mean, mm-hmm. I think it goes without saying why these barriers to entry, these permits, these licenses could be an impediment, right? Mm-hmm. They, they don't only protect the consumer, at least, you know, that's the idea, but they also make it so that there are fewer and fewer people competing for the business. Protectionism. It, it's a type right of protectionism. It's a type of protecting well, and nascent it's really, industry. It's really retrograde because it really goes back to like the old regime before uh, the Industrial Revolution and before capitalism where every, every uh, employment, line of employment was a caste mm-hmm. where, mm-hmm. where you were born into your caste and, and it was protected mm-hmm. from any kind of competition that you, know, you had guilds in the cities and, and, um, and um, nobles were, were protected. They didn't have any, any uh, competitors. And um, what really led to, to the prosperity that we enjoy today is free entry, is just fluidity mm-hmm. of that anyone uh, with enough pluck can, uh, even without a lot of startup capital, can, can just be an, an upstart and the, the incumbents, incumbents aren't able to legally uh, persecute those upstarts. But, but that's basically what these barriers to entry often are because they're often supported by market incumbents. Uh, the, oftentimes, big companies like regulations that mm-hmm. even they have to suffer because they know that they can bear them better right. than their smaller right. competitors. Right. Mom and pop can't sort of bear those six days as easily as a giant conglomerate like Walmart. Yeah. Well, I hate to put Amazon under the bus, but they were one of the ones lobbying for this internet sales tax. Were they lobbying for it? I thought yes. they were lobbying against it. They were lobbying for it, huh? I'll have to check. I okay. thought I read that they were lobbying for it. But it, it wouldn't be surprising because, again, so so with this internet sales tax, basically now uh, with this Supreme Court ruling, every company has to uh, be collect sales taxes uh, for um, – Every, every state regime, as long as the, the business is coming from, the customer is based in that mm-hmm. state. And Amazon, you know, they, they've got a huge legal department. Right. They can handle that easily. Mm-hmm. But all these tiny little uh, internet companies, uh, m- mom and pops, a- a- again, or, or individual uh, companies, they can't handle uh, such, a, such a burden. Let's take mm-hmm. a step back real quick, too, because I think a lot of people tend to think, all right, if I'm going to hire an architect, I want a licensed architect. If I want to hire a plumber, I want someone who's bonded, insured, and licensed, right? So there are possibly some some reasons in the back of our minds why we think these roles and occupations should be licensed, or at least there should be some kind of method to account for them if they mess up. But there are other ways to account for businesses or, or people who perform certain tasks and other ways to hold them to account, right? I mean, mm-hmm. we, in this world of, you know, pick up your phone and summon a, uh, a person to deliver your food or a plumber or a gutter cleaner, whoever, we have all these different means to hold people to account. We're not living in a world anymore where there's one plumber in town, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so there are, there are other occupations, of course, that are being regulated and, and licensed as well that might seem a little less necessary than the architect, like shampooing, shampooing, shampooing hair, yeah, and you got mm-hmm. hair braiding, horse yes. massaging, 
as we all need to have our horses massage. <laughs> Their teeth need to be filed from time yeah. to time. That needs to be licensed. Coffin makers, casket makers. And coffin ma- sellers as well. <laughs> there, there were some monks who were creating coffins, and our friends at the Institute for Justice actually won a case that allowed them to continue to do that. And so, uh, yeah, floral arrangers. Yeah, floral arrangers, in interior Louisiana design, specifically. Yeah. yeah. And so it's kind of gone a little mad. Especially in modern day and age when there are so many, I mean, I would trust Yelp much more than I would trust mm-hmm. any uh, government agency in uh, reflecting the, the reputation of, of a business that I want to mm-hmm. do business with. We did mention protectionism a moment ago, and I do want to make sure we dig into that because the real reason that that works as a protectionist thing, licensing, is because it freezes people out from joining. Mm -hmm. The barrier to entry Mm -hmm. prevents new entrants into that market. So for example, if you are a floral arranger and you only want to have those who are licensed from your school performing work in Atlanta, our hometown, Mm -hmm. for example, you might want to make it extremely difficult for new people to actually get into that business. And so it Mm -hmm. makes it so that there is a smaller amount of competition because you've instituted this formal government-sponsored licensing regime. Right. Well, it begs the question, who is creating the test that people have to pass in order to become licensed? Absolutely. The boards, which have a lot of these companies that are saying, we only want you to hire from us, right? right. So it's all this circle of protectionism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it really hurts people who have a skill but maybe don't have a lot of capital to start their business. So we like to use the example of hair braiding because to be a hair braider, maybe all you need is a chair in your Mm -hmm. skill. There's not a lot of costs associated with starting that kind of business unless you're forced to go to a cosmetology school and pass a test where you have to learn how to do hair techniques that nobody does anymore. For example, pin curls. These are the 20s waves. Um, Perms. Perms. Nobody (laughs) wears these hairstyles anymore, but... To become a licensed cosmetologist, you've got to know how. So there are obviously many regrettable things happening, but in your home state of Utah, there's actually some reform happening as there's well. There's some great reform happening. So yeah, light light in the darkness. There's a few things. The city of Riverton, which I've actually lived in, it's a great city, um, just actually outlawed permits. No more business wow. permits. They're done. They're not going to do it anymore. They want to encourage business owners to come to Riverton and set up shop. So that's done. The next law is there's a childhood entrepreneur law, which protects child entrepreneurs from not having to get a license, permits, nothing. In fact, Utah just this past weekend had a big child entrepreneur fair where all these kids got together homemade items (laughs) selling. It was pure, you know, chaos to these protectionists, but everybody had a good time and everyone's safe. And friend of Fee, Connor Boyack. Uh, Yeah, Connor Boyack, who spoke Mm -hmm. at FeeCon, he, uh, Libertas, the organization he runs, has been integral in just demolishing these occupational licensing restrictions. So it's been really great. Permit Patty, beware Utah. (laughs) Your days are numbered. (laughs) Well, we're going to take a quick break and we'll actually be back for the final segment of the FeeCast to talk more about this. We'll see you in a second. Hi, I'm Sean Malone, Director of Media for the Foundation for Economic Education, and I want to talk to you today about Fee's podcasts. You're currently listening to our wonderful FeeCast, but did you know we also have two other amazing podcasts for you to listen to each and every week? There's Words and Numbers featuring Anthony Davies and James Harrigan, where they talk about economics, political theory, and current events every Wednesday. We also have a brand new offering called the Fee Audio Experience, where we bring you content from our seminars and events held all across the country. You'll get to hear fascinating talks from speakers and panelists, which we'll make available to you right after each event. So be sure to check out the Fee Cast, Words and Numbers, and the Fee Audio Experience right here on our homepage at fee.org shows, and also subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. Thanks for listening. Welcome back to the final segment of today's FeeCast. We've been talking about barriers to entry and occupational licensing, permitting, but there are many, many other forms of barriers to entry as Marianne, you define them. Mm -hmm. Um, One of which is my favorite slash least favorite, and that is the minimum wage. It is my favorite because it has so many rich points to discuss and my least favorite because it blocks the poor and disadvantaged and young and inexperienced from being able to get jobs. And that may be actually an unpopular opinion because the minimum wage appears to be a very popular kind of policy. And there are efforts underway to get it to be uh, nationalized, to get the federal minimum wage to, to be $15 yeah. an hour. But the minimum wage is an extreme form of a barrier to entry. In fact, mm-hmm. Dan, up to, I think, uh, maybe this afternoon, you were using this image of 
the ladder without the first few rungs, right? right? Mm-hmm. And that's the, like the person who's trying to get their start is not able to begin to climb because yeah. they're basically frozen out of the market. Yeah, I mean, uh, an, employee, an employer can only afford to pay an employee the, the revenue that, they, that their contribution br- brings in. And mm-hmm. so if you set the minimum wage above that, then you, you make it a loss for an employer to, to, to do that. And so it disincentivizes them from hiring in the first place. It's exactly where uh, people are not yet able to provide very much value where they need that experience. Uh, it's not only the, the money that, that an entry-level worker is getting paid, it's the experience. And based on that experience, they can, they can climb up the ladder. But when you're knocking out those bottom rungs of the ladder, you, you disable them from getting that kind of experience. You're basically making it impossible for them to work at a rate that it would make sense for someone to pay them. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And you know, that actually reminds me of um, unpaid internships. This is a big deal for me. I got my start with my career because I took an unpaid internship where I learned a lot of things. Now they're trying to outlaw those entirely. Yeah. They're trying to say no unpaid internships. Unless you're in Congress. <laughs> right? Then if that, you're then a congressional it's fine. office, yeah, then, then you fine. can intern or have yeah. someone as an intern with no fee. But or how no do you pay. get into this, this fear that you're trying to get into? Especially if you're not willing to, to do it to just get the experience. So they are icing mm-hmm. people out of the market. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Minimum wage wage is a, is a tough one for me. It's an issue that I've, my opinion, has kind of evolved on. I used to advocate for more regional minimum wages, so not necessarily the $15, but ones that were based on... Living weight, like cost of living. Right, based on, based on the locale. But I've really have come away from that, just for the reasons that, although I hate the idea of people working really hard and not making a lot of money because... I think of like dishwashers and retail workers and people fast food who are making the minimum wages. It's not that they're not working hard and adding value. It's just that you can either have jobs without a minimum wage or you can have fewer jobs with a minimum wage. Because what happens when you install a minimum wage is that over time, in the long run, employers will switch out people for machines. And we're already seeing this at McDonald's and other kinds of restaurants where they're just putting kiosks instead of people with faces. You know, the first time that I saw that, I was in Poland with my husband Colin this past August, and everywhere in Poland and McDonald's, which we patronize probably more than we should have when we were abroad, (laughs) there would be a kiosk that would have a touchscreen that he could select. He's a very picky eater. Sorry, Colin, but you are. You can select (laughs) exactly what you want. So there's no room for human error, right? The Mm -hmm. cashier can't select mayonnaise when no mayonnaise should be there, right? And then we went to Denver about probably three months ago. They're in Denver. They haven't yet appeared here in Atlanta, so far as I know. Maybe, maybe Airports, so. Airports, but not nowhere else, yeah. Okay. Um, but you're right that when you impose a minimum wage, you freeze certain entry-level uh, jobs from uh, or people from going into jobs. Mm-hmm. Then you make it more and more likely that we're going to begin automating right. and moving the human equation out of it altogether. And it's probably not a good thing for people who are just beginning to start out. I I think what is especially problematic is when you couple the two. When you have minimum wages, then you also have occupational licensing. So I don't have maybe a lot of um, lucrative skills that nobody's going to pay me to be a brain surgeon. But perhaps I have the skill of braiding hair or I can blow dry somebody's hair. And if there wasn't this obstacle of occupational licensing, perhaps I could be making a lot of money in one area, but I can't. So I just have to take a minute. a, what is the current minimum wage? Seven twenty-five, I think, federally. Here in Georgia. Right. How much more money could people be making if they were free to pursue other opportunities? And that comes in with re-entry. I mean, you have people getting out of prison uh, where recidivism rates are astronomically high yes. because they can't mm-hmm. find jobs. This so is when people end up streets, going back into prison. They go prison. back to prison. Right. But if you eliminated these licenses, a lot of um, people want to get out and be barbers or paint nails, be mm-hmm. you know makeup artists, things that you really don't need a formal education for, sure. mm-hmm. but they're barred from doing it. And then where do they go? They end up selling drugs again or doing whatever it is that got them in there in the first place. And the whole cycle continues. You know, there's actually a really good video, part of our Common Sense Soapbox series that's on the minimum wage and actually not only on the economics that we've been discussing here, but on the history of the minimum wage, where there were actually parts of the American uh, society that actually wanted to freeze certain types of people out of work, including African Americans, including the elderly, what they would call invalids at the time of the early part of the 20th century. (laughs) Women as well. And so, you know, you begin to think, you know, how, you know, this seems well-intentioned, right? Mm -hmm. But what other purposes might it be serving a minimum wage? In uh, South Apartheid South Africa, that was uh, a motivation for the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. 
You know, another breaking story this week, uh, aside from Permit Patty, is this uh, new decision coming out of the Supreme Court on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. uh, it was Janus versus AFSCME, and AFSCME is a conglomeration of uh, local labor unions. In, in Chicago, right? Well, they're all over. They're, they're all over the country. Uh, amalgamated Federation of State and Local Unions. It's something like that. State, the, county, and municipal employees. There it is. So everybody, a catch all. Everybody. And it's yeah. all government unions. And mm -hmm. um, this goes to not quite barriers to entry like we've been discussing, but something related. It's kind of in the same gene pool. And that is, once you take a job, can you be forced to pay a part of your salary back to another third party organization, namely a labor union, in order to keep your job? So it's not quite a barrier to entry, but a barrier to sticking around. Yeah. And so what the court ruled on Wednesday is that uh, if you don't wanna join the labor union, mm -hmm. you don't have to pay these, what they're called agency fees. Mm -hmm. And that was codified law for decades that you had mm -hmm. to pay, even not as a member of a labor union, you had to pay sometimes 40 50 60 dollars a month the particular plaintiff richard uh, janice actually paid 45 dollars a month to keep his job wow. he paid that to the labor union and that's gone now that was ruled in a 5-4 right. decision on wednesday i mean yeah. that's gone for the first time i think wagner act great depression i mean this goes back it, this is it does. this is huge it for, does. for rights of association workers right. and correct me if i'm wrong i think in the case of janice those those agency fees are sometimes used for lobbying efforts. And so that's why I think the court ruled that it was a violation of the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's take a minute. Let's talk about that because money is fungible, right? Just mm -hmm. because you take money in for a certain purpose as agency fees and you have another stream of money coming in through union dues doesn't mean it can't intermingle, right? Mm -hmm. And so a, a labor union survives off of the mm -hmm. cash flow it gets from both labor union dues as well as agency fees. And you're right, Marianne, even mm -hmm. if they say that they can't use that for lobbying, for mm -hmm. electing uh, any uh, type of favor, like political of action, political action, mm -hmm. exactly. All that money helps them, right? And so this is going to be a big deal for labor unions now, government labor unions, where they don't have that predictable cash flow from these non-members anymore. They're going to have to figure out what they're going to do. And this is labor unions, I think, in a, in a lot of ways have had a lot of good things to do, especially in the private sector. But with government or public sector labor unions. And compulsory. Compulsory you know, yeah. labor unions. Mm -hmm. That's a different story altogether. And so we're going to see a very different kind of outcome given this ruling. Which is interesting to see because in this era of, I believe Zach Slabach called it, was it entrepreneurial decay, yes. I think yeah. was the term, which is great. What what are we what are we fostering? What kind of environment? And maybe there is going to be a switch. People are mad about permit poverty. People are mad about labor mm -hmm. unions. Maybe we are on kind of the cusp of something big here. It'd be interesting to see. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of different things have changed in the past few decades. We yeah. have the ability to communicate instantaneously share over the stories. internet, share stories, <laughs> buy things from anybody, whether it's an Etsy uh, seller or eBay seller, or you know, even this a big thing like Amazon <laughs> kid, kid on the street. Absolutely. And so there are a lot of different opportunities that have emerged that make us begin to wonder whether this regulatory regime that we've lived with for decades actually still makes sense be interesting to see. Yeah. So a few other things uh, from barrier to entry standpoint, we have taxes, right? We have regulations generally. There's a new data regulation out of Europe that we're all having to follow now. And that's why actually you probably got three weeks ago, a barrage of emails from various places that you've signed up for, uh, you know, bought things from, got emails from. Mm -hmm. And this is the general data uh, protection regulation from Europe that requires a huge amount of, co of compliance and smaller places uh, maybe not as well equipped to take those on as Amazon or as Walmart. Mm -hmm. And even if it's not a European company, as long as they have uh, customers who are resident in Europe that they have to comply with right. this. And so that's why you've got every internet service that you've ever encountered, it, it seems like, that they, they were like spamming yeah. your inbox. And like part of the justification was to prevent spam. And then you're getting like even more spam <laughs> because of it. And presumably one resident would be enough. Only If only one person lives yeah. there, then that's justification. So we want to make sure that you don't have any barriers to entry to find out what kind of cool economic ideas we're talking about. So we put all kinds of links in below the video. Please check them out, and we'll see you next week on the FeeCast.